Hello, I am Dr. Esther Ngumbi. I am a professor at University of Illinois Abana Champaign, Department of Entomology and African American Studies. What inspires me? I am a researcher. Uh, science uh, is full of surprises and every day when I wake up, I never know what uh, my science discoveries that day are going to be. Uh, therefore, I am always excited to come to work uh, because uh, I'm following on the path of curiosity, uh, but most importantly, uh, curiosity that's going to allow us to uh, grow our crops sustainably amidst a changing climate that's bringing all sorts of uh, stresses for our agricultural uh, crops, including uh, maize, tomato, and uh, many other crops. What are some of uh, the challenges or obstacles as I have faced in my career? Again, as a scientist, as a woman, uh, we are still few. Uh, that number, uh, according to uh, UNESCO, is 30% of the scientists are female, and we have a long way to go to ensure that many women can uh, be a scientist and can enjoy the passion and the exciting journey of uh, discovery. How can we support others? Again, I think uh, finding mentors. I love uh, to find myself mentors so that you can always know you are not alone. Please join our next seminar in the Catalyst of Change series on October 3rd. Welcome to the Catalyst of Change, Women Leaders in Science Seminar Series. There is interpretation available in Spanish, French, and Hindi. To access interpretation, you choose the language of your preference by clicking the translation button at the base of your Zoom screen. We invite you to follow us in LinkedIn, YouTube, and social media using the hashtag Women in Science for the Catalyst of Change, Women Leaders in Science Seminar Series. On the screen, you will see the QR code that will give you access to Slido for submitting questions and comments to be addressed in the Q&A session. We will be hearing today from an extraordinary research leader, Stert Numbi, Assistant Professor in Entomology and African American Studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Esther Numbi will be interviewed by Olivia Odillo right after her presentation. Olivia Odillo works under the Accelerated Breeding Initiative Program as a research associate for breeding optimization and costing at CIMIT in Nairobi. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Brian Govers, Director General of CIMIT, to officially open the event and welcome our distinguished speaker, Esther Numbi. Dr. Govers, the floor is yours. Thank you, Isabel, and good morning, good evening, good afternoon, uh, depending uh, where you are. It is our pleasure to host you once again in this uh, TED Talk Meets Fireside uh, chat. And today we have an extraordinary young leader. As you know, we have taken a philosophy, you can't be what you can see. And in that sense, uh, every two weeks, we are uh, putting a spotlight on remarkable women that have shown leadership in science, but especially leadership in change. Dr. Esther Ngumbi is our next Catalyst of Change guest speaker. She is a Kenyan entomolo entomologist and an academic who is currently Assistant Professor of Entomology and African American Studies at the University of Illinois at the Urbana Champaign, where she also teaches science communication. She grew up in Kuale County, a rural community in Kenya, she was introduced to farming at her age of seven, and her parents actually gave her a strip of land to cultivate cabbage. It's therefore that as a child, she became aware of all the challenges a farmer faces, including drought, bad soils, and the fact that your decisions have a clear impact at the end of the season. The first time she left her village was to attend Kenyatta University, where she earned her bachelor's and master's degree, and as you may well know, 
Kenyatta is one of our key partners in Nairobi in relationship to, to many of the projects we have there at Summit. And in 2007, she was awarded an American Association of University Women International Fellowship that allowed her to complete a doctoral degree in entom entomology at the Auburn uh, University. In 2011, she became one of the first people from her community to achieve a doctorate. This is how we see that she has led the way for many others to follow later on. And she was selected by nobody less than Barack Obama himself to be part of the Young African Leadership Initiative. And she mentors, therefore, still today, young researchers through the Clinton Foundation. We are, I'm very happy to announce to you and to, that we can listen together to the fantastic story of what is yet again an outstanding women leader. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Baum, for uh, the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who is tuned into my uh, talk this morning. As uh, already the introduction has been uh, shared, I was uh, born at the Kenyan coast, beautiful uh, Kenyan coast. I was born in a very small rural farming community. And so uh, as a way to supplement uh, our ability to feed ourselves, my parents who were primary school or elementary school teachers practiced farming. So as a young girl, I grew up farming and I truly enjoyed farming as, uh, and I enjoyed going to the farm early before going to school and after coming back from school. And I enjoyed the process of growing crops because I knew at the end of the season, we would have food for ourselves and for our family. And because I love the process, uh, at the age of seven, I wanted to do it alone. And I asked my father if he could give me just a little section of uh, our family farm so that I could practice what I had seen my family doing. Uh, my father was gracious enough. He did not give me the entire, the whole farm where we farm. So he gave me a strip alongside the river and I gladly took it. And I raised cabbages. And for a month, my cabbages grew very well. Every morning I would go to my little strip and I would sit there and just enjoy looking at this thriving cabbage patch that I had. And one day a month later, the rains came and it rained for three days. And as I watched every day, the water continued to rise above the cabbage. For a few days, I was sad. I was sad because the joy of watching my cabbages grow had already just quickly been taken off. And the field flooded because it was along the river. And after the water resided, I had lost my cabbage. The joy that had built was gone. But this heartbreak continued because again, uh, farming through as a young girl, we put a lot of our efforts into uh, taking care of our crops. Halfway through the season, I would watch all our hard work go to waste. Insects would come along, chew on our corn, beans, if it was not insects, drought, flooding, and all the stressors that are associated with climate change came along. And I would watch all our hard work go to waste. But at the same time, I knew when we lost our crops on the farm, it would mean that we won't have food. And I realized that it was not happening on our farm alone, our neighbors, 
our community, our Kwale County, uh, and across uh, Kenya. These challenges that are impacting our agriculture were leading to food inse insecurity. And as a girl, I was very curious, I started being curious about, first of all, how do these insect pests find our crops? And when they find our crops, why can our crops uh, be resilient enough to overcome these stresses? Little did I know that this curiosity was leading me into my, what my career is today, an entomologist. But growing up in a rural a village, there were no role models. There were no scientists. There were no people or entomologists that I could look up to and be inspired to know that first of all, yes, you can make a career out of entomology, that yes, you can be a woman in, in science. And so I would say, as I was growing up then, I wanted to become an accountant. And for reason being, my parents and I would go, they would uh, take us to the banks when uh, the opening day to go to school, they withdraw their money and send us to school. And I watched these bank accountants seated in uh, well air conditioned rooms and it was beautiful. And I was like, I wanna be them. I wanna work in an office. But little did I know that science would find me. So I did very well in my high school examinations and ended up being recruited to do a Bachelor of Science at Kenyatta University. And when I went uh, to my college and I still remember going to the lab, my first lab, stepping into the lab was such an exciting day for me. And I had so many questions and I remember doing an ex my first experiment and getting excited. I was like, wow, this is this what scientists do? Is this the journey that's uh, associated with discovery? And I wanted, I remember not wanting to leave the lab because I wanted to answer all my questions that I've grown up uh, having and questioning nature. But at the same time, uh, again, I'm always grateful to mentors and that's why I acknowledge mentorship. And I ask and humbly ask every one of you who is listening to me, be a mentor to someone. Share the excitement of what you do to others. Because at my uh, all along my career stage, it was mentors at Kenyatta University. My teachers saw a spark in me. I was curious. I wanted to find answers to the questions that, that I'd grown up with. And they said, uh, sure, we have international insect of physiology that was uh, right almost 15 minutes away from Kenyatta University. And luckily there were scientists that would work with uh, professors at Kenyatta University. So as a, as a young college student, undergraduate student, uh, undertaking Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry and Zoology. I remember mentors, my teachers, uh, introducing me to scientists at uh, this center that was close to us. I could do science. I could do uh, experiments beyond uh, what uh, we were doing as part of my uh, courses leading up to my uh, undergraduate degree. And it would be just such a chance that uh, the scientists that I ended up uh, working with were working on uh, a biological control program. They are working to understand how uh, maize or corn that is impacted by many Lepidopteran pests. And for this particular project, it was Kyla Potellas and a, a complex of uh, Lepidopteran pests that uh, feed away on corn and maize and taking away uh, food from uh, farm and farm fields. And so they were wondered, they were looking for sustainable solutions to uh, 
control this uh, Lepidopteran uh, pest complex. And amongst the solution was uh, natural biological control agents, parasitic wasps. But plants don't talk, uh, don't, don't, uh, cannot uh, run away when they're attacked by caterpillar pests. How do they communicate and call for, for help is through releasing this uh, chemistry. And so I discovered that there is a communication, a wave of communication that's happening between our food crops and uh, the community of uh, organisms that associate with plants. And so I did my uh, Master of Science at Kenyatta University, continued uh, this uh, curiosity of finding out how can I generate solutions to uh, farmers, solutions to um, our family farm where caterpillars and insect pests and other uh, climate associated stressors are um, impacting and taking away from uh, the farmers and the hard work that goes into growing these crops. And I did, uh, I graduated eventually at uh, Kenyatta University with a Bachelor of Science, continued on. I remember because I was so curious, I wanted to find answers. I started my Master of Science project even before I had graduated. I was a semester early, but I was so passionate because I wanted, I knew I had to find answers to this issue that impacted our ability to grow crops, to feed ourselves at my farm, at our community. And I also graduated with my Master of Science. But I remember all along my parents growing up uh, in, a, in a poor family, my father and my mother always said, education is the gateway out of poverty. And they consistently encouraged me to go to the highest level that I could go education wise. They told me, my daughter, we can't give you anything but education. And I knew I had to go to the top. So I finally uh, joined a PhD program at Auburn University uh, in Alabama and continued again uh, asking questions surrounding this topic of how do we sustainably feed ourselves amidst a changing climate that brings all sorts of stresses to plant from insect pests to drought to flooding. So at Auburn University, my big question I was pursuing is how does how do plants defend themselves? How can plants uh, call for help and get the help they need so that they can grow and produce the food that we are dependent on. And among uh, one of the uh, chapters that was part of my dissertation was also looking at this wave of uh, organisms, the beneficial soil microbes that are living in our soils and have been true partners to plants, helping plants to uh, resist all these uh, stresses and helping plants to grow better so that we can have enough food for everyone. And it was also a very exciting uh, chapter, which ended up uh, not only giving us results, but allowing uh, me to uh, be called an inventor. We were able to get at least three US patents out of our work. But along the way, it was mentors, mentors, people who saw the spark. I was, again, I was the first generation, uh, never stepped out of uh, Kenya. And look, I was here at Auburn in the United States pursuing uh, my curiosity, wanting to find solutions as to how we were going to feed uh, ourselves and humanity sustainably. And after I remember graduating uh, on, it was a beautiful day. I will never forget 
the summer of 2011. My parents would not be there for my graduation. And I still remember walking the stage. Here I was. It was a day to celebrate, but it turned out to be a day of reflection. It was real that women like me were few in science. That I was only one of the many women that I'd grown with at my rural village in Kuala County that was privileged to have a PhD. And I wanted not to be the only person. I wanted to make sure that that same door that had walked that I would leave it open, that I'll do my best to bring other women along because it was not sweet to be alone. I didn't want, because at the end I was lonely. I was the only, uh, I didn't have uh, uh, other peers to be excited with too. And so, and I decided that never ever would I try to be alone in everything. I would step up to be a mentor, step up to encourage other women, step up to encourage other children from rural communities to say, hey, you can do it. You can dream. You can follow your passions. And you can be a scientist. After graduating uh, with my PhD, I did a couple of postdocs, uh, starting off at Georgia Tech and then returned back to Auburn. And then today uh, I am at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. I'm still following my curiosity, the passion. I'm still following the questions that started on as a young girl. How do we sustainably feed a growing population amidst a changing climate? And today, climate change is a threat to our ability to grow these crops. From flooding, to drought, to insect pests, and these uh, stressors happen, they can happen individually, sequentially, or in combination. But I'm still happy that I'm in the front line of discovery, in the front line, looking for solutions. And as I say, every day as I wake up, I'm so excited to get to my lab because I don't know what that day my science discoveries are going to be like. I don't know, but only through experimentation can we find out. So today, uh, uh, having uh, a lab, the Ngubi lab, we do research. Uh, we are investigating how plants can uh, thrive when they are, even though they are being uh, bombarded with all these uh, stresses, we are looking at uh, how these stresses, first of all, uh, impact the ability of plants to grow. What are these stresses changing from uh, looking at the wave of uh, beneficial microbes that lives be, uh, below ground, all through to the chemistry, the way of communication in the plant insect uh, natural enemies world. We are trying to find a holistic answers into how climate change uh, impacts this. But more importantly, I think once we understand, then we can uh, start to develop solutions that uh, allow us to uh, grow crops, no matter the threats that come along. And to do this, uh, I appreciate that my work is very collaborative 
Uh, for example, uh, right now, my lab is undertaking a USDA-funded, United States Department of Agriculture-funded project that's looking at how uh, maize crops will uh, respond to flooding. This I call one of the very under-researched stressor that has the capability to undermine the progress we build in uh, developing climate resilient crops. In my lab, we are understanding when flooding happens, how will, we, how will it change uh, the monumental gains we've uh, taken at the understanding soil microbial communities, soil health. And when those communities of beneficial soil microbes are changed, what does that mean to the ability of crops to grow and to be able to produce the food crops that we are hoping to? But remember, I've said I have dedicated part of my work into inspiring others. In my community, we continue to work with farmers to ensure that we empower farmers. I work with our younger people. I want to, in my lab, we have undergraduates, graduate students. I believe in, I don't want to do science alone. In bringing along a generation of scientists, because Science is such an exciting field. And I know when we diversify who is doing science, first of all, our solutions become sustainable. So I'm committed to diversity, committed to bringing others along, committed to uh, ensuring that farmers who work so hard especially smallholder farmers who work so hard in their farms can grow crops, can see all their hard work pay off. Because uh, I know from my growing up, the smallholder farmers, they don't have other ways of uh, supplementing their crops and, and supplementing the food they're getting from their crops. So if their crops fail to grow because of uh, climate change uh, associated stresses, what that means is they go hungry. What that means is we, and we know that food is so essential at that younger age. We know that it impacts the mental, the ability to develop uh, younger generations that are have this mental um, prowess and smartness. We need a generation that is uh, just intellectually competent. And I know that it is so important. And I will continue to uh, follow on this journey of finding solutions to feed our growing planet, but realizing that I cannot do it alone. And being a mentor, because as uh, Dr. Bam said, you can't be who you don't see. And to all of us that are listening, I challenge you to step out of your comfort zone. Get out there. Share about what you're doing. And, uh, and in doing so, bring others along. We need all of us. And that number today, again, uh, quoting uh, UNESCO, we still have very few women scientists. And I hope by the time I'm done with my career, that number changes, but it's all going to depend on all of us. And thank you once again for, uh, for this opportunity to share about uh, my life journey and uh, I look forward to the conversation that ensues uh, after this. Hello, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Esther. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. That was such a remarkable bio on your agricultural work and the work that you do. And also being in the front line for the discovery and solutions for all the problems that farmers change out here. And 
I would, uh, I'm here also to back you up and just assure you that the work you do in the front line is not in vain. Um, my nine years in the research field and uh, meeting all these uh, stresses that uh, farmers face, and when we have solutions, it offers a better outlook and uh, a stronger one for that matter. And uh, even it uh, modifies and strengthens the economic outlook and the farmers are really happy. So this is just to urge you to continue fighting hard. It is be getting better and better. And I know eventually we will be there. And uh, to you all, my name is Olivia Odio. And also I'm a member of the CIMIT Women in Crop Science Group. And I was so honored for the opportunity to interview Dr. Esther today because of uh, her passion and engagement in agriculture since her early childhood days. Remember she said she started agriculture in, uh, at seven years old and uh, all along she hasn't looked back even a single day. She's still pursuing her career and her passion in that. And also was interested in her advocacy for girl child and also the rural communities, especially women. Uh, empowering them to be knowledgeable both in science and uh, technology. And also we can, we, I want to congratulate you for the Dr. Ndumi Faulu Academy that nurture girls and women to be more involved in science and take in the front line towards science and in, in innovation. And also my interest uh, to talk to you this evening, this morning was also about uh, your uh, there were several recognitions that uh, you have contributed to science and also your public engagement. So I was so much thrilled to hear about your vision for the future in terms of foods and uh, agricultural systems and uh, the sustainability in the long run so that uh, both farmers and uh, for the economic, uh, global economic good so with that, such those few interests, uh, I have a few questions for you that will just be engaging so that uh, we can have a clear understanding of uh, your interest in details and maybe the nitty gritty that uh, you need to tell the women folk and there are also women in science about your entire journey as an entomologist. And uh, the first one that I would uh, put on is uh, I'd like to start by asking do you think there are particular challenges of being a woman working in the field of agriculture? And what about being an African woman in agriculture? So thank you once again uh, for such an excellent question. And uh, as I said, the numbers are quite few and it can be lonely. Uh, it can be lonely uh, being in a field where you don't find others that look like you. And uh, it can be challenging sometimes. I do feel lonely, yes, because uh, I, I'm trying to kind of find people that look at like me so that we can just have a conversation. And uh, most importantly, I always say as a minority, uh, you have to do more to, to prove yourself and to prove yourself to others that yes, you are, you belong that, the seat you're occupying is for you and is not for somebody else. And so it's that by itself, uh, even though we are in the edge where, yes, it's okay to do, it's it's always in the subconscious mind where I know that I have to do more. I have to be more. And secondly, again, as a, as a first generation scientist, and uh, I don't know many of the steps, uh, it's, now, the first time when I'm writing a grant proposal, I'm writing, uh, I'm, you know, writing uh, for uh, publications, all these steps, you, it's like you are just, it's your first time. You're not, you're not sure whether you're doing it correctly, but whether you're not sure whether it, this is going to work. So all those challenges are, are, uh, are just everyday challenges. But I always, I'm a very uh, optimistic person. I always say challenges make you become better. And uh, I always try to, ch to uh, channel those challenges and to turn them into opportunities. For example, if I write a grant, it doesn't get funded. 
and but I use the reviews and say, okay, how do I make it better? I reach out to my mentors and say, this is what I'd written. Uh, this are this is some of the comments. How do I make it better? Uh, realizing that uh, there are many others that have come before me, and leaning on to them to uh, get the advice I need. But uh, yes, challenges. And again, as, as I said, just knowing that even though it's been a while trying to find these solutions, the more we find the solutions, the more climate change becomes real, bringing much more. And, and so it keeps us on our toes every day. Uh, but challenges become opportunities. Challenges become uh, uh, that opportunity for me to be more, to uh to grow. And more importantly, I think they, they give me a room to grow and to be humble enough. So what would you possibly say is a standing icon being an African woman in agriculture in one sentence? I think I don't have one, but all women that are in science are my icons. And because I know, especially the minority women, I know what it takes to be there. I know the journey that they have gone through. So I I try to see every scientist as an icon to me. And and I don't have a particular name because I have, if I give you, I'll give you all the scientists that are there. <laughs> yes. Right. Uh, but uh, maybe I should you that um, it's not going to be lonely anymore because more, more women are stepping up into agriculture fields and uh, that's a bravo for us. So uh, what kind of support do you cultivate for yourself to keep your energy and confidence up as a leader? Do you have some networks that you do tap into, the hobbies you pursue, or what are your sources of inspiration? So again, the support comes from mentors. Uh, as I said, uh, I all my journey, my support uh, network has been mentors and I've actively uh, sought out for mentors because uh, as I said, as a fast, as a pioneer plowing the way, it's, I don't know many of the things that I engage in, but I know that others have done it. So I lean on uh, mentorship and from everyone. And I ensure I always have a, a, from full professors to associate professors to uh, postdocs to my undergraduate students to uh, the younger ones. I, I, I kind of try to generate a support system that, that uh, is very, uh, is uh, streamlined across uh, can say a longitudinal uh, support system. But also I think I do have hobbies. I like uh, going out for a run uh, because sometimes uh, the kind of our career as academics can be stressful to be very honest. Uh, and so in the mornings when I can, I get out there, I go for a run. I do have a spinning bicycle. I do uh, my spinning and, and sweat it all the stress out. And um, Again, I encourage everybody to find mentors. Mentors have been really a true support system uh, for me. Uh, but also, um, again, I allow also to, uh, to be challenged as well. Uh, I, I encourage that I'm not just uh, very, that I'm smart, but I'm not, you know, I can always learn from other people. So, uh, it's good to tap on onto um, mentorship. But also I do read a lot and I find groups. Uh, I find, I try always to find also groups that are doing similar work, groups that care about uh, women empowerment, groups that care about agriculture. So I try to also join in a lot of the groups, uh, development agencies and uh, join the conversations. And because I know joining people that are actively thinking about these issues, that are actively uh, providing solutions, allows me to stay up to date with what is going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for that. Uh, yourself, you're a science communicator teacher, and also you're an active science communicator. And allow me to loud that uh, you are even selected by Barack Obama himself 
to be part of the Young African Leadership Initiative. Uh, based on that, what would you advise uh, women who lack confidence to take on the leadership roles? And also how can uh, they overcome feelings of inadequacy? This will go a long way. So first of all, again, uh, I would say uh, feeling like an imposter is, is real. It, it uh, impacts a lot of us. And sometimes even when I walk, I walk into spaces and I'm like, I'm like, am I belonging here? Is this my seat? Is this really my seat? And so you'll continue to have that. But again, you belong. Always remember, you've walked this journey. Nothing was given to you on, on the plate, on a silver plate. You've gone through the challenges that come along with uh, being in science. And when you get where you're in the table and you have a seat there, yes, you belong. And secondly, why I truly enjoy science communication because the world today has so many challenges and research is actively generating these solutions. But the challenge is most of these solutions are in in, uh, they're in uh, libraries, they are embedded, they're lost, they are just uh, preserved in this dissertation thesis. And the public is not aware of what's happening. And by actively uh, participating in science communication, we, the scientists who are in the front line, when we take that extra step, that extra challenge to uh, share, that what we are discovering. First of all, the public becomes aware of what's going on. Secondly, we facilitate the translation of research products into uh, products that farmers can use. I always say, for example, when we had this uh, three US patents out of our research on uh, beneficial soil microbes, we have companies that started to develop products out of this. But if you keep all that knowledge uh, in a dissertation, it may never be able to reach to the people that are translating this knowledge into actual solutions that farmers can use. So part of uh, participating in science communication is to lead the way because we need solutions uh, at the moment, science backed solutions. And for us, doing a communication can facilitate that. And to others, as I said, you belong. You belong where you are. Step in comfortably and step in, do your part. But as you do your part, also remember to bring others along. The statistics are not going to change without every one of us actively stepping out of their comfort zone to inspire others, to bring along, to open our spaces, our love spaces, whatever research you're doing. Next time you're going to a farm, bring another young person and say, this, this is the kind of research I'm doing. This is what uh, the solutions I'm generating. And in doing so, we facilitate and we bring the numbers along, the many other the young generation along. And we also inspire others that are started in science and then stepped away. We wanna, we can't afford to lose any more scientists. We need them. And we need diversity. I Again, I will emphasize diversity. So the more we do our part in communicating the science, stepping out there, sharing what we are doing, the more we bring others that, that need to be on the table. Yes, Dr. Esther, we belong. That's a take home for me. Uh, yeah. You wear so many crowns and uh, I know it doesn't come without challenges. So can you talk about a time when oh, you are faced with a major challenge in your career path and how you handled it and how you grew from that experience? So yeah, challenges are real and they're real because... Uh, 
you do science, you, do, you know, science does not happen in, in a in a vacuum. A science happens uh in 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 uh, spaces. But you know, to sum up, yeah, you know, I've faced a lot of uh, challenges, and uh, I think uh one of the ways that I overcome challenges, uh, as I've uh, shared, is through uh using the challenge and taking a step back, say. Why did I fail? How can I learn from my failures? And what can I even uh, learn from uh, that uh, particular challenge? And and sometimes there might you know there are lessons that you can take away from uh, challenges, and sometimes there. Are, there will be no lessons too. So there, 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 there's some times that there's nothing, you know, that you can take away. But again, I think just to, as a woman scientist, it's, it's, it's not been easy. And, but uh, amidst the challenges comes moments of growing, uh, growing as a person, growing as a human being, but also it becomes an opportunity to share uh, and, and, and to uh, teach others. And uh, so I would say that, you know, in as much as I wanna name challenges here and there, but I wanna say that for me, challenges are just uh, a way of growing. And, uh, and I encourage all of you to uh, use your challenges as opportunities to, to grow, to be better, to, uh, to find the lesson, Sometimes there are obvious lessons that come with failure, and sometimes they are not so obvious lessons. So try to find the obvious, the less obvious, and uh, use them uh, to be better or to grow. Olivia, please unmute your microphone. All right, thank you. Thank you for those insights. Uh... Let me just wrap it up by asking, what would you give to CIMIT to grow and support its women leaders? What advice would you give? So again, uh, mentorship, open the spaces, uh, allow people to come in and, and, uh, and be curious. Mm -hmm. uh, as a woman scientist, as a, as a curious driven scientist, allow people to, uh, uh, to walk in, try, try this thing called science and 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 facilitate facilitate their uh, growth I, I think and even when they fail um allow them to take a lesson and i probably now that you know you asked that question i remember the first time i i was in ecp and we had you know this uh, proposal this question we were pursuing and i did an experiment and and all the hypothesis was we did not find out that what we said to to find out. And I remember coming to uh, my mentor, Dr. Baldwin Toto, uh, who is still my mentor, uh, almost twenty years uh, after I left ECP. And I was almost like I thought my journey in science was that was the end because I was I did not find answers to this question. But he looked at me and said, "In." you may not have answers, but the answers that you brought in terms of a negative experiment, there's a lot of things we can take away from this. And he said, you're not a failure, but this is the way science happens. And I still retain Dr. Toto's words. And every time I do an experiment and things don't turn out, I remember Dr. Toto saying, Look at that experiment. See what's what are the the takeaways you can get. And so, uh, for CMIT allowing uh, women to come in to walk into spaces of science and do the experiments, fail, but they're growing. Have mentors for them. Uh, open up professional opportunities for them to grow. Again, it is networking is such an important currency in our world today. Ensuring that these young uh, emerging uh, women scientists have networks because it is those networks that open doors 
It was those networks that facilitate the growth and the networks that allow us to uh, empower. So th those are the catalysts of change. This conversation today is about catalysts of change. I think the networks that, that people have and forever allowing those networks to uh, facilitate many more to join in and facilitate also uh, push, you know, playing back and generating back the knowledge, uh, the wealth of knowledge that this uh, generation of scientists has. We have to give it back. We have to uh, open up all the science that we've done so that it, the ones, the, 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 the science, data evidence that can be used to generate solutions needs to be out there. So I think, uh, again, uh, let's make space for these uh, women. Let's uh, professionally grow them. Let's professionally uh, ensure that uh, they have all the tools they need to succeed and not only succeed, but succeed while empowering others. Thank you so much for those personal insights and uh, wonderful remarks. Uh, I would like to return the uh, the platform to my colleague, Isabel. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for this very interesting conversation. Uh, we are very grateful for this, um, Olivia Wadillo and Esther Numbi. Um, so now we, are we would like to open the floor for questions from the audience. We invite you to raise your hand, to turn on your camera, and unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question or comment, uh, or you can submit it via Slido. Um, Irene, I think she is ready to make a question. Would you like to open your micro and your camera, please? Otherwise, we have so many questions received by Slido. So while uh, Irene is getting ready, I can uh, read one of those questions. So um, Esther, mentorship has been so critical for you and you yourself are, very, uh, uh, are a very active mentor, which takes time, of course, as much as it is rewarding. So how do you balance the time of being an active mentor and also being a researcher? So that, that is a great question. And I've always said the things that you passionately care about, you create time. And you create time because those things occupy a very special part of your heart. As I said, I wouldn't be here if it was not for mentors who took an interest in me and held my hand and are still holding my hand up to today. And so, Again, amidst a, a very chaotic world of uh, academia and science, I do create time and it doesn't have to be a, a long one hour block. So every time I, I think I try to, and my style of leadership and mentorship is uh, come as you may, whenever you need my advice or whenever you need that critical uh, time to just kind of have a chat, I'm there for you. So I do carve out time. And I carve out time because I care about it. And I encourage others, yeah. And even if it takes my weekend away, yes, because it's it's something that I care about. And I, I, I'm happy to take my weekend away to ensure that another person can benefit from either my uh, networks, can benefit from uh, my expertise, can benefit from just seeing me and saying, she met, she made it, she's making it, I can do the same. Thank you so much. Uh, there is one more question. What message or advice you would like to give to men in science who want to help promote equity and advancement of women in science? So again, first of all, uh, I never mentioned by, but my father who is a man was my big number one supporter. And uh, we are a family of four girls and uh, my brother who uh, is deceased, uh, this uh, died this year, rest in peace. But men play an equally important role. 
And so first of all, in uh, supporting women, ensuring that you open up your networks to uh, again support, uh, first of all, women. When you go to a conversation, a table, a, a, a sitting where uh, you find that your women colleagues are being looked down upon, step up for them. We need uh, men uh, stepping up for women. Men are uh, stepping up in uh, supporting uh, women uh, and being there. So yes, men have a very, very important and essential part because when women succeed, men succeed as well. And don't, if you happen to go in a room where you don't even have the presence of women, step up, speak up say in the next meeting or you refuse to to be part of a conversation that doesn't have a uh, women in it so we i think they need to step up and uh step up and speak up confidently and ensure that you never participate in something that doesn't have a uh, women because i think though we are few you can still find them make an effort to find them Thank you. Uh, uh, Irene, would you like to try uh, to open your micro, please? Yes, let me try now. Okay. I Thanks. hope you can hear me. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Esther, thank you for the inspiring talk, uh, you know, about your line of work and how you're impacting at the grassroots level. I have one question for you. Uh, we know that agriculture and technology are sinking in resolving today's food problem with the aspect of climate change. Please tell us, uh, maybe you advise, what are some of the ways you would encourage the use of technology in empowering information and engagement of agriculture tasks at the grassroots level, most especially with the women and the youth girls through your sources of work that you've been you know, engaging with? Thank you. So, so thanks, thanks again. Uh for such an amazing question. So technology is at, at, at the forefront of, of everything. Technology is amplifying, first of all, uh, the knowledge, you know, ensuring that people have uh, the knowledge at, at their cell phone level, at their, they can, you can at least access that information that's going to uh, be very important. So I think it's important that we ensure that this technology uh, infiltrates and down at the grassroots end, we are able to uh, empower the people that possess the cell phones. They are already there to make those cell phones become like factories of uh, or catalysts of change, catalysts of uh, the ability to tackle this uh, climate change associated uh, issues. For example, with armed with technology, being able to uh, first of all know what insect species are. Uh, attacking those food crops because when they know then they can uh, use uh, targeted interventions to uh, address those uh, immediate challenges so I think technology and then we have now we are in the era of artificial intelligence how can we ensure that we find ways to to use technology to uh, benefit small older farmers to empower them with solutions so that uh, they can uh, grow crops sustainably using uh, technology to understand what is the season going to look like even before they plant their crops with that knowledge then they can okay do we plant and what crops do we need to plant what uh, intercropping uh, strategy are we going to use how to do we access markets how do we uh, continue to even uh, anticipate challenges ahead of time i think technology is going and continues to play an important role and all we need to do is just be there and also facilitate our uh, workshops where uh we can uh, ensure that those people that have the access to that technology use it to the maximum, to the best possible ways to get the answers and, and so on. So I love technology. I know it is a catalyst also of change. It is a catalyst that can accelerate uh, getting the solutions, uh, science-based solutions to the farmers and allowing them to use them to uh, make a change that is so important at that small holder farm level. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Esther, for your great 
talk and stimulating presentation now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Brian Goberts, Director General of CIMIT, to officially close the event. Dr. Goberts, over to you. Thank you, Isabel, and, and, and wow, if uh, these two women actually didn't remind us of why we do what we do. If this is not impact for the stakeholder, uh, then, then I don't know. Uh, which other testimonials could, could could give us that insight. So never forget who we work for. Esther, thank you for honoring us with your presence here today. And thank you to everybody who's joining us online. In the UN General Assembly a couple two weeks ago, I had the honor of, honor of hearing Secretary Blinking personally declare that soil health is a matter of national and international security. This is how far your results of res research, Esther, that of you and others uh, have uh, already made it. What an exciting story. From leading by example in the village to being a mentor, showing others how to follow their passion and become a scientist. Once again, thanks. And what I take home is, yes, you belong. Yes, we all belong. Up to here, we have now heard of several key women leaders in this Leaders of Change seminar, in this Catalysts of Change seminar. So we thought it is time to watch again the highlights of several of the past speakers. And, and I'm sure you will also be looking out for who is up next. When we cease defining ourselves by what we do and live ourselves as who we are, because when we are true and upstanding to ourselves, others believe, care, and ultimately will follow. There needs to be two things that every leader in different sectors should have. The first thing is representation. So a leader should represent your values, your principles, and your goals. And it should be an aspirational thing to think about your leader. And the second thing that every leader should have is administration capabilities. This means to be able to solve problems, to be able to learn on the spot and to be able to work as a team and be disruptive without being destructive. We are looking forward to a time when there is no more hunger, when there is enough food, the right food grown in the right areas, and that food can be available for everyone. A woman could be a leader without being a man. It could be a woman could be a leader in her own style. And that style might give much better results because it's based on being compassionate, it's based on empathy, and it's based on bringing the best in every single person. So we can change, but we have to be open to change, and we have to be supportive of many others to help promote and actually institute change. Women are natural agents of change and all they need is a conducive environment. As women, we should be spending more time with other women, making sure we share our stories, our successes, and our struggles. The whole idea is to convince each other it can be done and that we are the best agents of change. Please join our next seminar in the Catalyst of Change series.